I've heard Martin do different versions of this teaching in a number of different ways, especially on the school of leadership that he runs for our network of churches up in Sheffield. And uh, it's been become a really important foundation for the way uh, the Bible is taught through our network of churches, looking at scripture, seeing God's big picture, God's big story, and understanding where we fit into it. Not how does God fit into our world, but how do we connect with what God has done and is doing through the ages. And so we thought it would be fantastic to not just have that as something that we, we send him to do to go and bless other people but we wanted a little bit of that blessing back here in Shrewsbury helping us to have a real foundation in the scriptures to know the context of the different things that we're reading quite often you hear people say things like oh that's only in the Old Testament oh that's only in the New Testament oh did Jesus really say that and all those sorts of things and so we're going through this series so that we can see the whole sweep of scripture and how these different things fit in so so I'm delighted to uh, ask Martin to come forward now and to bring us the third session in this series. Over to you, Martin. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, everybody on Zoom. <clears throat> what do you feel when <clears throat> somebody uh, invites you to come to a showing of a film, maybe a Netflix film in their home, and... You arrive 20 minutes late, and they've already started. You've not seen the film before, and have you ever had that feeling of, why did this happen? What about that? Why did that person come in? Where does this fit together? Anyone had that feeling? If you're a football supporter, <clears throat> What do you feel if you, if you go to a football match, either on the television or, or a live football match, and you can only arrive in the second half, and your team has already scored twice in the first half, and you only capture the action in the second half, and if, you, if you're watching it on the telly, you're longing for the end of the game so you can see the replays of the goals that have been scored. You're in the middle of the story. And sometimes that's how we feel in life. We kind of come in on a situation and we're in the middle of the story. That conversation in the pub or in the coffee shop and it's already got going and you arrive halfway through and people are talking about something. You're not quite sure what they're talking about. You smile in the relevant places, but you don't really know what they're talking about. Ever had that experience? I travel around the country quite a lot and I stay in people's homes and sometimes I have the experience that halfway through the evening they're very friendly towards me but then the kids start talking to the parents and they start talking about the holiday they had last summer and how they went to this beach and did that and I'm completely lost because I came halfway through the story and I wasn't there at the beginning. And by the way, that's how I feel about Star Wars. I've got a very strong problem with Star Wars. Because to me, Star Wars is the original trilogy back in the late 70s and the early 80s, the return of the Jedi and the Empire Strikes Back and everything. That's Star Wars for me. That's when I watch Star Wars. So when three more films are produced which happened before the original, I can't get into those. And then three more that are produced that happened after the original, I can't get into those either. Because for me, that's the, that's the story. But I realize now that the bit I know is the one in the middle. I don't know the beginning. I don't know how Darth Vader came about unless I go and watch the other ones, but I don't like them very much because I like the originals. And then I'm not really so interested in what happens to Ben Solo and all the rest of it in the last ones because that's all too late for me because I like the original. But then the problem is I came in the middle of the story. And that's exactly what most people do with this book. Because when we enter into the Christian faith, by definition, we enter into, into it through an, an understanding of what Jesus did. And our first impression is that we're off the track He's going to get us back on the track. He died for us. He's offering us forgiveness. And we dive in and we're saved. And the Holy Spirit comes and we feel absolutely thrilled. And it's amazing, isn't it? 
And I remember that feeling. And for the first few years as a Christian, I read the New Testament avidly. But you know what? I hardly ever bothered with the Old Testament, except the Psalms, because that's good for a pick-me-up on a bad day. And a few juicy prophecies that somebody told me were about Jesus, I thought, they're worth having in Isaiah and one or two other places. But as for the rest of the Old Testament, I hardly dipped into it at all. And when people said, you've got to read the whole Bible and start from the beginning, I felt a dead weight of pain come upon me because I thought it's painful in those early books because I don't know what's going on and I can't see any relevance to my life. Ever had that feeling? And yet, it looks like well over half the Bible is the Old Testament. So in the big picture, we're filling out the background. Creation, we looked at first of all, how God made everything how it was perfect in functionality at the beginning, how man was, had a special place, mankind, in the image of God. And then last time when we looked at the fall, we looked at the fact that there was a fundamental disruption. Something went wrong in the early days, in the time of Adam and Eve. And that dysfunction spread out across all humanity. We started having really dysfunctional relationships and problems between us and violence and conflict and disease and death. And we noticed last time also that the natural world no longer functions in the perfect way that it used to work. And now, today, we look at what God did about it. What's God going to do about a broken creation, mankind separated from him in darkness? What's he going to do? You see, the story from Adam and Eve onwards in the following chapters in the book of Genesis is a terrible downward slide. You read those chapters, Genesis 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and you see it's going downhill fast, mankind's heading for disaster, conflicts between people are escalating. Violence and murder and difficulty comes in all sorts of different ways. What's God going to do? It's a very, very dark picture in those early chapters because the impact of this fall is cascading down on generation after generation of mankind. And then God brings a flood in the time of Noah. And the very first glimmer of hope on the horizon comes in the time of Noah, after the flood, <clears throat> when God says in Genesis 8, never again will I curse the ground because of humans. Even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from, from childhood, and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. And this is God beginning to put a stop on decline. He basically promised mankind, he said, the earth and the environment you live in will be basically stable through every generation. I'm going to give you a safe environment. I'm not going to destroy this world. And that's the first glimmer of hope. But our story really today begins with a very, very important man, Abraham. Those guys next door heard me say that, so I'll say it again. <laughs> Abraham. Oh, they didn't hear me the second time. <laughs> Abraham. He lived in a place, modern-day Iraq, on the Euphrates River, in a big civilization, lots of pagan gods, lots of temples. We got the archaeology. We can work out what was going on at the time. And God began with one man and his family. And as we go through today, you'll see Abraham's the key to everything. And this man, Abraham in some mysterious way, heard the voice of the living God in a clear and decisive way. We don't know how that happened. It would have been a miraculous revelation. 
And in Genesis 12, the Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. These are some of the most important words in the whole Bible. He set out on a journey which turned out to be a thousand miles on camel and on foot. That's like taking a journey from here to Berlin on foot. And it took him years to do it. And he traveled up the Euphrates River to a place called Haran. Then he paused there and his dad died. And the Lord said, carry on. And he went down to a land called Canaan, now known as Israel. And when he arrived there, God spoke to him again. And he said, I'm going to give your family this land. So what's in those promises there in those words I will make you into a great nation and I'll bless you and I'll make your name great and you'll be a blessing three things that were promised to Abraham he said you'll have a name now a name means a successor a family and he didn't have a family because the text tells us that his wife was infertile Sarah was unable to have children was already advanced in years and God said to him despite her infertility She will have a son. Now, that was a miracle in itself. And from the name, according to these words, God promised that there would be not just a family for Abraham, but the family would turn into a nation. And that means a whole people group with a land. Because you aren't a nation until you've got a place to live. Otherwise, you're nomads, gypsies, travelers. That's what he was. And miraculously, this infertile, very elderly lady, and we're talking of a couple in their 90s, despite years and years of infertility, miraculously, many years later, had a son called Isaac. And he had a son called Jacob, and he had 12 sons, and they formed a nation, and it was called Israel. And God was forming a people from this one man and his wife, Abraham and Sarah, a name and a nation. And the third thing it says in that passage is the most important thing for us. He says, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Every ethnic group that lives on the earth is going to experience divine blessing because of what I'm going to do in you, Abraham, in your wife, Sarah, in your son, the miraculous son, Isaac, and in the family that's being brought out from Isaac and Jacob and his 12 sons. From that people, something's going to happen that will reach every ethnic group in the whole world world the rescue plan of God has started now poor old Abraham had difficulty those who suffer with infertility find this issue it's painful it's difficult time passes opportunities pass disappointments come again and again and again and for Abraham it's stacked up year after year after year after year No child, no child, no child. And then one day in Genesis 15, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abraham. I'm your shield, your very great reward. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. That was his servant. And Abraham said, You've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. And listen to this, then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is from your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And he took him outside and said, look up at the skies and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord, 
and the Lord credited it to him as righteousness. He believed that he'd have a son and he'd have a nation and his nation would become very numerous. But the real focus of this is that these people are going to be used for a special purpose for everybody else in the world. That's the point. It's the other nations that are the focus in the long run. God's rescue plan is on the move. And the next thing we see is that further along down the line, as the nation gathers, all the people gather together, they can't get into the land because they're going to exile in Egypt and they need to come back into the land. They can't function until they're in the land. They can't be fulfilled until they're in the land. And so miraculously, Moses leads them out of Egypt in the story of the Exodus. And then they arrive in the wilderness at a place called Mount Sinai in the desert, a whole nation. And they have a divine encounter with God. The whole nation experience the presence of God in a dramatic way. As recorded in Exodus chapter 11. On the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. And here these people are being gathered and what God's going to do at this particular point, he's going to say, right, you're going to enter the land soon. Get ready. The land I promised to Abraham. And hear the rules for being in the land. It's known as the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, and loads of other laws. And here are some priests. And here is how you should worship. And you're going to have a big tent in the middle of your camp, and it moves around with you. And above the tent, my presence is going to be visible day and night, year after year, as you travel around the wilderness until you get in the promised land. And you're going to sacrifice animals. Because I'm showing you Jewish people the way that I'm going to forgive sins. Because mankind needs to be reconciled to me and I have decided how it's going to happen and it is through sacrifice. And so we learn something incredible in the Old Testament summarized in Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11. Just in one verse, for the life of a creature is in the blood, and I've given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It's the blood that makes atonement for one's life. And in this moment amongst these Jewish people, God revealed for all humanity how he was going to resolve the problem of rebellion and sin. There will have to be a substitution. You can't get out of your sin yourself. Somebody's going to have to do it for you. And amongst the Jews, the symbol was the animal, the sheep, or the cow, or maybe the bird. Sacrificed, it died. And somehow, rather symbolically, the things that you did wrong would, would be transferred across to them. But it was only a symbol of a greater reality that was to come. The reality of Jesus Christ. And to the Jews was revealed that the way that God was going to resolve sin. Could he have done it another way? Maybe he could. But this is how God chose to deal with the sin of the world. Through atonement, substitution, one life given that another life may be saved, symbolized in Jewish sacrifices, fulfilled in Christ Jesus, whose death on the cross wasn't just a symbol of love, as some people say. It was an actual transaction. Jesus described it himself in Mark 10, verse 45, as a ransom. He paid an actual price. A death bringing life. But that only makes sense 
because the Jews had a revelation beforehand of the way God was going to work. He was laying down the foundations for his salvation. He was explaining things in advance. He was building up his purpose. So we got Abraham and this amazing family. We got Moses helping them to get into the promised land. We got the priests. We've got their place of worship. And the one thing they needed to add into their national life to make sense, which they did a few hundred years later, was a king. They appointed their own king, Saul, and he was a failure. And God said, I've got a better idea. Here's my man. And he was called David. And the prophet Samuel picked him out and said, he's going to be God's king. David was really excited because he captured the city of Jerusalem and that consolidated the whole nation. And his first thought, Lord, was, Lord, let's just build you a temple here. Let's have a temple. We've had this tabernacle. It's a really bit of rag now, this tent. We keep mending it over the hundreds of years. It's been around the block a few times. Let's get rid of that. Let's have a permanent place of worship. So David had this idea, right, I'm going to build this magnificent temple for God. But there was a prophet in his household, and his name was Nathan. And during the middle of the night, he was woken by God, who said, I've got a message to give to King David before he starts building that temple. And it comes in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Nathan comes to David and says, The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I'll raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This is a reference to his son Solomon. I'll be his father, he'll be my son. When he does wrong, I'll punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love I will never take from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And the last verse is important. This is the key. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And what he means by house is a dynasty like the house of Windsor in our own country. The prophet Nathan said, David, God's revealing something else to you. We've got Abraham and the people. We've got Moses forming the nation. We've come into the land. We understand the sacrificial system. We know how God is going to deal with sin. But now the final bit of the jigsaw comes in place before we get to Jesus Christ, and that is that the kingdom of God is going to be based on a descendant of David. Your dynasty will rule forever. People descended on you will be the instruments of my kingdom. Now, the funny thing was that all David's, uh, his, that, that monarchy was abolished later on. But the Jews had a prophetic hope. And later on, the prophets began to realize that the next step was a Messiah a savior. And they began to realize, Isaiah realized he's going to suffer and he's going to die. And Isaiah also began to realize this savior is going to be in the line of David. So gradually the picture's coming together. We're moving closer to Jesus Christ. We've got a people in the land. We've got a worship system. We've got a priesthood. We've got a sacrificial system. We've got a monarchy. We've got the promise of a great son coming after David in his line. And when we come to the line of Jesus, it's very interesting that both through his mother and his father, he's a direct descendant of David, although in his stepfather, not biologically. And so when we come to our Christmas readings, we read in Isaiah the following words without necessarily thinking much significance to them. And you'll often have heard these words from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You know that one? We all know it, don't we? But listen to the next bit. Bearing in mind what I've said of the greatness of his government and peace, there'll be no end. He will reign 
on David's throne. And over his kingdom, establishing him and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And so now all the pieces are beginning to come together in Jesus. And so when the angel comes to Mary, she says to Mary, not only is your son going to be the son of God, but he's going to be the successor of David. He'll sit on David's throne. And the Jews had this expectation at the time of Jesus that sometime soon, David's great successor was going to be revealed to Israel, the Messiah. And so when Jesus started performing miracles, Matthew 12 points out a very interesting thing. On one occasion, he performed a spectacular miracle, healing a blind and mute person with demonic affliction simultaneously and miraculously. And what the people said was this. Could this be the son of David? In other words, the Messiah, the deliverer, the one who's going to die, the one who's going to fulfill the sacrificial system. Could this be the son of David, asked the crowd breathlessly, because they know the scriptures. And when Jesus comes into, the, into Jerusalem in the final week of his life in the triumphal entry, do you remember the crowds have their um, palm branches and they, their slogans? Do you remember the slogans that they, they're singing? One of them was this. Hosanna to the son of David. Salvation and praise to the son of David, in other words. Messiah has come. And it turns out that this is the moment where the promise to Abraham it can now be fulfilled that his nation are going to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Because at the time of Jesus, this Jewish story, which has been building up and developing over all these centuries with these different elements in it, this Jewish story suddenly breaks out of Jew Jew Judaism. And it starts amazingly on the Damascus Road when a man called Paul was going along the road. And Jesus revealed himself to him with a blinding revelation. And he said, you're going to the Gentiles. You're going to the nations with the message about Jesus. And lots of other people followed him. And so the church spread out into the nations with dramatic and swift effect from the very, very first generation. And so, let's go back to Abraham. Paul says in Romans 4 that anybody who believes in Jesus is a child of Abraham. You don't have to be a Jew. You just have to believe in Jesus and the gospel. We're all connected to the very first person who God called on this journey of salvation. And there are two things that God said to to Abraham about his descendants, two metaphors about their numbers. And I want you to think about this. First of all, that they would be as numerous as the stars in the sky, and then even more powerfully, that they would be as numerous as the grains of sand on the seashore. But can I say to you, if, you're, if you believe in Jesus, I say this very respectfully, you're a grain of sand in the salvation kingdom. You're there. 
And you're, as it were, one of the stars in the sky, the unnumbered stars. There's so many of them, we can't see them. Most of them are out of, the, out of our range visually. God spoke to Abraham and he said, I'm going to do something through you which will transform the world completely. And so Abraham is my father. Salvation didn't start when Jesus came. Jesus came to fulfill that key part that only the Son of God could do, which is to die for us. But God had it in mind 2,000 years before Jesus when he spoke to Abraham what he was going to do. And so Christians rarely thank God for Abraham and his faith and for Sarah and for Isaac and for Jacob and for the great leaders, Moses and David, who took the story on. Now, in case you imagine that I might be making this up in terms of, in, of getting rather sentimental about Abraham, and I do get a little bit emotional when I'm preaching sometimes, but let me anchor this in a text that we're going to put up on the screen from Galatians chapter 3. I hope it'll come up. I want you to really let this sink into your heart. Paul. Understand this, that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles, that means all the peoples of the earth, by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham, all nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed <coughs> along with Abraham, the man of faith. Isn't that magnificent? Absolutely amazing. Our Father had you in mind and me in mind 2,000 years BC when he spoke to Abraham in a remote place called Ur of the Chaldeans and said, leave your family, leave this place, come with me. Going to create a people, going to create a nation, and from that nation, I'm going to bring salvation to every single nation in the whole world. And that's exactly what has happened in the history of the church. And that process of the gospel going to the nations now is happening in many ways more energetically in your lifetime than in almost any other previous period of time. As the sheer energy in the church, in sometimes the most dire conditions, takes this message forward and this promise is being fulfilled all nations are being blessed through Abraham. And so it turns out, after all, that it's worth having the Old Testament in the Bible. It's turned out, it turns out that it's not just an advert for something to come. It turns out that it's not just a failed episode where the Israelites kept getting it wrong because despite the fact they kept getting it wrong, God's purposes continued through the faithful remnant. There were always those who followed. And so the Old Testament matters. Israel is now in a sense also our own story. The story didn't start when the angel came to Mary and spoke to her. God had planned things and revealed things thousands of years beforehand. And so we're now halfway through our story of the big picture. 
and we haven't yet really got to Jesus. So there's an awful lot of great things to happen. Let's pray as we conclude. Father, I want to thank you for your plan of salvation, your plan of revelation through the ages. Lord, we're, we're humbled when we try and think about your incredible, immense work through the ages. Lord, it's so big and far beyond what we can comprehend or understand. And yet we start to see how you've woven us into your sovereign plan through what your son Jesus did. And Lord, as we look forward, we anticipate the sessions on Jesus, on the church, on you coming again, the new heaven and the new earth. As, as we look backwards, it gives us confidence to, to, to then look at Jesus and then look forward into the age of the church and what is to come. And Lord, I pray that we would live lives that are... Um, that we keep that sense of awe and wonder of who you are and what you've done through the ages, Lord. Lord, what happens to us day by day is important and it does matter. But Lord, we don't want our gaze or our view of the world to be shaped by the things around us. We want it to be shaped by who you are, what you've done and what you're going to do, that the God of the ages has drawn us into his big story. And I pray that that would be a real source of hope and encouragement to people, even in the coming week. When things kick off, when things go wrong, when, when stuff happens, whatever that is in our circumstances, I pray we would stop, take a deep breath, and consider that the God of the ages has woven us into his big story. And all of this, although important, is temporary because we belong to you. Amen.